Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to another injury update on the Guilty as Charged podcast. Uh, my name is Jamison Omar. Uh, you can find me on, on Twitter at Chargers Medical. Um, you know, it's it seems like it's been quite the season uh, for, for the Chargers injury-wise. Um, so we're going to give a couple updates on a couple key players, just talk about some of the more serious injuries, um, a little bit about the medical background behind them. And then we'll, we'll end about talking about the uh, NFL's updated concussion protocol. Um, we've had a few players experience concussions. Um, and so I just want to talk about um, how the league's handling that. Um, it's a really interesting issue and something we're, we're still, uh, you know, working on um, handling well. Um, and uh, I just wanted to comment on, on kind of what the new procedures mean for the, for the league. So without uh, further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, pretty, pretty miserable list. Uh, we have Keenan Allen out, of course. Uh, DeAndre Carter had an illness. Unclear whether he'll be able to make it and play. Um, we obviously saw Corey Lindsley go down earlier in the season with food poisoning. Um, it was doesn't sound like it's as bad as that instance, according to, to Brandon Staley. Um, but we will have to keep an eye on that. Um, we're gonna need all the help we can get at wide receiver this week. Um, so we, we, we really hope that he's out there. Um, Dustin Hopkins out, not, not uh, uh unexpected. Uh, Donald Parham, uh, Chris Rumpf, Jerry Tillery, and Mike Williams all out as well. Um, Donald Parham, another big blow for this team, uh, another hamstring at re-aggravation. Uh, Chris Rumpf, to be expected, the MCL industry in injury, we're going to expect him to be out another week or two. Um, Jerry Tillery, interesting injury. It sounds like he just had his back tightened up during a lift. Um, unclear what exactly that is. I, I don't expect it to be a multi-week injury, uh, but we'll have to keep an eye on it. it. It really is kind of an interesting strength and conditioning exercise that, that, that caused that one. So we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Um, so without further ado, we're going to touch on uh, Mike Williams today. We're going to touch on JC Jackson. We're going to touch again on, on Keenan, unfortunately. Um, and then at the end to talk a little bit about the concussion protocol. So getting started here, um, JC Jackson injury. Uh, it's a patella tendon rupture. Um, so just talk a little bit about the anatomy here. Uh, the quadriceps muscles, so the muscles on the front of your uh, upper leg, um, among the strongest muscles in the body, they're, they're responsible for really holding yourself up while weight bearing, extending your leg, really flexing hard. Uh, it, they're, they're among the strongest muscles in the body and they exert a lot of force when they're activated. And all that force gets channeled through the patella into the uh, lower leg and into the tibia. And you can kind of see where they, we have a patella uh, on this diagram here, a patella tendon tear. So unclear where exactly that tear occurred, but it occurred on the lower tendon. So this is not the quadriceps tendon above the knee. Uh, this is sort of below the knee where the patella uh, connects uh, to the tibia here. So uh, it's, um, you know, as some of the reporting has been, it's a, it's a pretty devastating injury. It's not all that common, but, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this was almost certainly a career ender. There was no way for a player to come back to any reasonable level of performance after this. Um, thankfully, uh, the medical uh, uh, procedures and, and kind of our knowledge about how to rehab these injuries effectively has gotten a lot better. And it's no longer necessarily uh, the, the season ender that it once was, but um, a study from the American Journal of Sports Medicine back in 2016 reported that only about 50% of players uh, have returned uh, to, to high level sports after uh, such an injury. Um, now that that took that took into account a lot of professional athletes in a lot of different sports. And so it wasn't just the NFL, it was kind of the rates of expected return in the NFL are a little bit higher. However, um, you know, a lot of notable players in the past have had these injuries. I think most notable probably Victor Cruz, um, a wide receiver, and was never quite the same afterwards. But um, other players such as uh, Jimmy Graham, um, you know, and uh, a cornerback, Morris Claiborne, had a very similar patellar tendon injury. Both came back. Jimmy Graham actually had a Pro Bowl season after uh, coming back from the patellar tendon repair, um, which is, you know, really admirable. So it's, you know, uh, you never count a professional athlete out. Uh, these people are, are are some of the most resilient that you'll meet. And, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that the JC Jackson will be working hard with the Chargers medical staff, you know, to kind of rehab this injury. Um, but the next steps for him, um, I, he's probably already underwent the surgery to reattach the tendons together. So reattach the, the broken patella tendon. You want to make that attachment really strong. That'll allow for early rehab because one of the biggest things that you're trying to avoid here is atrophy. When you, when you lose that connection, you're unable to flex your quadricep muscles and those muscles atrophy extremely quickly. So the, the keys for him will be to uh, make sure that that tendon is repaired nice and strong, have it heal quickly, allow him to start exercising those quads early in his rehab process. 
um, and we'll hope to see him back on the field uh, come training camp. The kind of estimated time is anywhere from nine months to a year, similar to ACL injuries or, or other ligamentous injuries. But the keys will be returning to function as quickly as possible and allowing him to kind of get back his quad strength. You know, incredibly important for a cornerback in such an explosive position. Um, so we'll just have to be something to monitor. Um, there's no guaranteed money in JC's con contract past 2023. Um, so um, it'll be important uh, to, to kind of recognize how he's coming back from this injury, really support him, you know, really not rush him back. He's an, he's a Pro Bowl cornerback and uh, the Chargers have invested heavily in him and he's kind of a, a, an important piece for, for the future of this team. Um, so this is not something that they're going to want to rush. And, you know, it's just really unfortunate after the start to the season that, that he had and the kind of the medical problems that he was dealing with his ankle um, for this to be kind of how his his first season on the Chargers ends. But you know, it's not all bad news. There is hope, um, you know, and there is kind of optimism for the future, but it's something that they're going to have to be very conservative about and, and and not rush him back because this is a very serious injury and, and it will take some time to recover. Next up, I just I just wanted to talk about Mike Williams and his high ankle sprain. Um, so just quickly to uh, kind of break down what a high ankle sprain and kind of the definition is. So um, the typical, when you hear ankle sprain, when you're walking down the stairs, you take a wrong step and you kind of feel your ankle turn over, that's traditionally a low ankle sprain. So those are your ligaments sort of on the, on the lower part of your ankle here on either side. Typically you have what's called this inversion injury. So your, your foot rolls, uh, in inwards versus an eversion injury, which is, uh, more uncommon, but, um, you can affect your ligaments on either side of your lower ankle. Um, that is something that, you know, if people do on a day-to-day -day basis, it's sometimes uh, in the NFL will make you miss a week or two, uh, but it's usually nothing that serious. Um, a high ankle sprain is a little bit different. So a high ankle sprain is when you um, are met, uh, affecting the, the ankle uh, ligaments that are a little bit higher up. So this is between your tibia and fibula and your lower leg. There are uh, ligaments that hold those together. And those uh, are what's called syndesmosis, is that kind of that strength of those two um, uh, bones holding together. So uh, in your ankle, you have your talus and you have your tibia and your fibula on, on one side and the other, and they kind of hold your ankle joint into place, allowing you to kind of rotate it back and forth. Um, if you have a high ankle sprain, a really bad one, you can, you can actually lose the, the strength of this connection. So this will actually widen and your ankle will be what's called unstable. So your foot will be able to move around in here. And that, that's a, uh, an injury that would require surgery. So sometimes you do see these have to go undergo surgery if we lose that stability of the ankle. In uh, Mike Williams' case, there was no fracture, so no fibula or tibula fracture. However, those ligaments were disrupted. Um, and uh, from what we can understand, it wasn't an unstable injury. He's not going to have to undergo surgery for this injury. Um, but it is a pretty, you know, serious high ankle sprain. So those ligaments will take time to recover. Um, from the recent reports, he is back to walking without the boot on it. Like he's, he's good. It's going to take some time. Uh, the estimated kind of time on these are anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, I do expect him to be probably on the, the latter end of that. If you saw the, the injury interview, it's, uh, uh, the injury video, it's pretty miraculous that he only ended up with this and, and no serious fracture or anything of this of the type, but, um, keep an eye out, um, among the kind of the Cardinals Raiders game. We're again, looking towards week 12, week 13, something like that to bring him back, uh, from this injury at anywhere close to uh, his level. Again, a wide receiver needs to be able to plant on this needs to be able to drive. So, so unlike, uh, Mac Jones, who experienced this, this injury earlier this year, um, you know, a wide receiver is going to have to have a higher level of function before they're able to return to the field uh, versus a quarterback whose mobility is important, but no, nowhere near as important as a, as a wide receiver who's out on every route, running and planting and, and moving around. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to touch again on uh, Keenan and Donald um, hamstring injuries. Um, we've kind of talked about them a lot. They, they really don't get enough credence in the NFL. I mean, the NFL is very seriously uh, investigating these because hamstring injuries, but they've seen an increase in um, severity and an increase in kind of predominance in the last couple of years. Um, and they're, they're really concerned about it. Actually, the, the injury data from the NFL shows that every season on average, there's two to three players per team. So that's, you know, we're talking about, you know, close to hundred players in the NFL that will suffer a hamstring injury at some point during the season that lasts the entire year. 
Um, and uh, it happens across the NFL um, and it happens to to players of all levels. So unfortunately, you know, if we're doing the math on the Chargers this year, Keenan and Donald are, are among those two. And um, they're just notoriously hard injuries to rehab. I mean, that muscle, you really have to let it, you know, strengthen back up and heal. Oftentimes, if you have a severe strain, like both of them suffered, that actually is associated with tears in the muscle. So um, they have to allow that time to heal, uh, inflammation to die down. And then once once it has enough strength, and then they have to rehab it again to some level of function. So they're able to perform um, how they were pre-injury. Um, I don't even want to put timetables on either of their returns. Um, Keenan, you know, it sounds like he had a minor restrain um, or a minor setback. It, it, it really, the wording is is kind of questionable. Um, it seems like Donald Parham's in the same boat. It seems like he actually restrained in this past week. So um, unclear when either of them will return to the field. Um, and uh, it is likely something that both will be dealing with to some degree throughout the season. So I, I hope to see, you know, either or both of them back in, in the coming weeks. But um, I think at this point, the Chargers have to prepare like they're not going to have either of them. You know, if, if they are able to return to the field, demonstrate to the coaching staff that they're able to run the routes um, at, at some degree of efficiency, then we, we could see a return, uh, you know, in the coming weeks. Uh, but um, it's, it's, it's not something that we could count on. Uh, and it's something that, you know, the most important thing for them is to make sure that these injuries are, are, are healed to a certain point, that they're not going to have any long-term effects moving forward. So we just have to be patient with it. Uh, and it's something that, you know, uh, that is, is, is extremely common and not something that the, you know, coaching staff, the medical staff can really help mitigate all that much. Um, and so uh, it, it's just something that is just really unfortunate injury luck, but it happens across the league and, you know, the Chargers are no exception to it. So uh, it's unfortunate. I'm supposed to go. I, I will be going to the Chargers 49ers game next week up in San Francisco. I was hoping to see Keenan play. Uh, I will wear my Keenan jersey regardless, but uh, it doesn't seem like uh, I will probably see him play that game, but um, which is unfortunate. But, you know, that's uh, that's the way of the NFL. You know, you never know exactly what you're going to see. Um, so to end uh, our, our discussion today, I just wanted to touch on the uh, NFL concussion protocol. Um, so something that uh, we've had a few players, including Donald Parham and Josh Palmer, um, you know, undergo multiple concussions this season. And I, I just want to comment on kind of like what what to expect within a game um, uh, to for for kind of how this process um, uh, will play out uh, in kind of in a game time decision. So. Um, the update, so uh, most people probably heard that they updated the concussion protocols after Tua's um, pretty uh, pretty terrible, honestly, uh, concussion, potentially repeat concussion that he experienced. Um, and that update, what that actually added to the review was it added a, a no-go symptom. So a symptom called ataxia, which is a neurological condition in which case you see someone wobbly, having some difficulty controlling their extremities, not looking stable on their feet. So that prior to the, the uh, uh, update, ataxia was not one of the no-go symptoms. Those symptoms included uh, loss of consciousness, um, some other uh, more serious uh, things as, like that. But um, what that means is that those no-go symptoms, if the um, uh, uh, independent neurological consultant on the sideline um, or a team doctor notices either of those symptoms, that player is removed from the game and it has no option to return. There is no testing that undergoes that would clear that player for return in that game. So um, what when it, when uh, games are ongoing, you have not only the neurological consultant for, I, for both teams observing the game, but you also have a third one up in the booth uh, watching uh, reviews and watching camera cameras and you also have several spotters at several points in the stadium looking at players and so at any point during the game if anyone has any concern they can actually radio down they have a direct contact to the to the head referee and they're able to stop the game and remove that player from the game for further testing um that further testing occurs on the sidelines or, or the locker room um we are uh pretty bad and this is an area that the nfl is really trying to improve uh, of of uh, judging a concussion for severity um, and also for for presence within you know a very short time span these things take some time to, to really test and kind of see the severity of the injury um, and it's an area of kind of active study about how can we diagnose these injuries quickly and efficiently and accurately uh, in a short five minutes so that player can either return to the game if they didn't suffer any injury or 
they can get the proper help that they need if they did. Um, and a lot of these concussion tests are based on player reported history and players want to play for the most part. So you, it needs to be something that's objective, something that cannot be uh, beaten, for example, for, for a player who wants to get back and play if they, they have suffered a serious injury. So um, for this example, let's say we had a player pulled off the field, they were taken to the blue medical tent, they're being evaluated by both the individual um, independent neurological consultant, as well as the medical team doctor, um, who then will con con concur and conduct an exam. Um, they will look at the interview, they will um, do some baseline screening based on to compare to a, a player's prior um, screening that they take before the season. Um, and then they'll make a judgment basically whether they need further evaluation, in which case they will return to the locker room and have a full medical exam, or whether they um, will be cleared to play. Um, so that, again, those in, include some complete neurological uh, testing as well as a, a, a written slash kind of NFL SCAT exam. The SCAT exam is kind of a universal standard that's used across sports to kind of evaluate for, for concussion um, in the moment. Um, and again, you kind of compare your scores to a baseline score and use that to kind of inform your decision on whether a player is at their neurological baseline. The rehab process from the concussion, so if a player is diagnosed with the concussion, they will be removed from the game um, and will not come back to play. Um, we've had a couple instances this year where players who experienced uh, a concussion during the game, Josh Palmer, were actually, they played the entire game and came back um, the next day or the day later and with symptoms of a concussion um, and were, were diagnosed after a game. So it's not something that happens frequently, but it is something that happens. And, you know, sometimes it takes some time for those symptoms to develop if it's not, especially if it's not a super severe concussion. But once a player is in the protocol, they have to clear these five phases in order to get back to play. Um, in the past, in previous seasons, we've, we've seen players have a concussion on Sunday, clear these five protocol steps in a week and go back to play. Um, we're not seeing that this year and, and they didn't really alter the phases. Um, it's really kind of a, a decision from the medical staff to be a little bit more conservative with how you're bringing players through these five steps. So uh, first and foremost, uh, all symptoms of the concussion have to resolve. Um, a lot of those times that's difficulty focusing, concentration, uh, headaches, um, issues with those um, types of neurological symptoms have to fully resolve. Once they do, uh, players allowed to can go back to aerobic exercise. So again, this is not even out in the field yet. This is in a gym, on a treadmill, on a bike, being able to get the heart rate back up without a return of symptoms. Um, if they pass that phase, they're able to go back to football specific exercise. This is often called individual exercises by coaches. So they're not practicing with the team yet, but they're back on the field. They're running routes, they're throwing the ball, they're, they're tackling dummies, those types of injuries that are non-contacts with another player. Um, but they also have to get through that phase with no symptoms. If that's, uh, if they pass that again, no symptoms, they can rejoin training. They're still non-contact at this point, but they can rejoin team drills, run non-contact, um, drills with the team. Um, and if they pass that phase, they've cleared that phase they can, um, are given one final evaluation by the medical team doctor, uh, uh, and uh, they were then re returned to what's called full act football activity clearance. At that point, they're allowed to resume contacts in either practice or uh, a game type setting. So these are the five steps that every player has to go through. Uh, multiple people will evaluate this player as they are going through it. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of the NFL that we live in now, there's still a lot of work to be done um, and a lot of research that's going into better diagnosing and better treating these, these injuries. Uh, it's sort of, uh, we're in a, our infancy of, of how, how to deal with these well and how to protect players for the long term. Um, I won't comment today on, on the relationship between concussions and CTE, but there's a lot of evidence that shows that there is. Um, and uh, we are, you know, first and foremost, gotta have, we have to protect these players for their long-term health and well-being moving forward. So um, that's just a quick uh, dive into the NFL concussion protocol and its updates for this year. So thank you for joining, guys. Uh, hopefully this was helpful uh, to you um, and uh, will... Um, uh, be uh, kind of useful for giving more context on uh, NFL injuries um, and, and kind of how those are affecting the Chargers this year. So uh, it's been a pleasure as always. Hopefully I don't have to come back and report as often in the next couple of weeks. But uh, if you have any questions about injuries that Chargers players are, are suffering, feel free to uh, uh, contact me on Twitter at, at Chargers Medical um, and I'd be happy to respond. And I usually post updates uh, in semi real time during games about 
injury severity or, or comments like that as well. So it's been a pleasure. Uh, hopefully, again, again, I don't have to come back and see you soon. But uh, thanks for joining the Guilty as Part uh, Guilty as Charged podcasts uh, injury update for this week.